Hi there, my name is Julia, and over the next five minutes, we're going to be walking through some key concepts of technological failure from the perspective of my mind. I figured the most natural way to structure my mind map was to separate the topic of each week into its own branch, and then focus primarily on the learning activity topics in the corresponding sub-branches. I'm a very visual person, so I decided to distinguish each topic with a different color and illustrate some of them with important case studies that stuck with me throughout the course. I also thought that visually it would make sense for the map to flow in a clockwise direction, but you'll get the idea behind the flow and organization as we walk through a high level overview of the concepts. So we begin with the first two weeks of the course, where we introduce different schools of thought around technological failure, as well as different historiographies of failure. You can note that even though we briefly explored technological determinism and neutrality, the ultimate perspective of this course was social constructivism. We then talked about the relationships between market and technological success and failure. A key example studied here was the case of the gas absorption versus electric compression fridge. By the time the gas fridge hit the market, it was already dominated by the electric fridge, so there wasn't much of a competition, which showed us that the market isn't necessarily a neutral playing field. In order to understand technological success and failure, it's necessary to contextualize the mode, means, forces, and relations of production. Which leads into our next topic being network externalities, path dependency, and lock-in. Here we looked at the case of the QWERTY keyboard where the market chose a standard even though there was a seemingly better alternative. As previously mentioned, in this course we took a social constructivist view on technology. The Scott framework challenges the linear model of innovation, suggesting that innovation is in fact multidirectional. The first step is to show interpretive flexibility. That is, what does the technology mean to different people? In the case of the bicycle, for example, this could be related to safety, ergonomics, or overall effectiveness of transportation. If these meanings are shared among different people, they begin to form relevant social groups. For example, female riders and the elderly both played a big role in addressing concerns of safety, because older models of the bicycle used to have a very high front wheel. And by prompting for safety, the wheel was eventually lowered, and this established some closure leading to the bicycle design we know and love today. Next, we have another important theory called actor network theory. Ant considers both human and non-human elements as actors within a network and says a technology can only be birthed within that network, meaning nothing exists a priori. Whereas Scott looks to explain the meanings of stable technical objects, Ant seeks to analyze technology in the making through heterogeneous engineering of actor networks. Now looking at the stabilization or destabilization of technology, we can attribute some degree of a tech success with its level of user involvement throughout development. Like in the case of the OrCam, we can see that even though a technology may seem great, it can still fail if it's abandoned by its users. One of the best ways to prevent technological abandonment is by ensuring that users are involved from the beginning stages of a product's development. User-producer interactions are essential because of the importance of user participation in the innovation process so that developers can meet the user's needs. Sometimes we can have a technology that's actually pretty great, but has some unanticipated unintended consequences. That is, the technology wasn't designed to work that way, but it still comes with these unforeseen negative side effects. A good example of this, and one I find very interesting, is social media and the effects it has on mental health and body image. With this in mind, we can categorize consequences into four different scenarios, each one ultimately using the anticipated unintended consequences to gain insight on potential UUCs in order to account for these hypothetical problems. Some more extreme cases of consequences can often lead to accidents as a result of a given technology. These accidents can be classified as normal, which is defined as inevitable and typically a one-time thing that's unlikely to occur in the future. The other option is epistemic accidents, which are likely to reoccur in the future unless we change our existing knowledge about that technology. Next, we move on to failure in institutions and the environment, where we began by exploring this concept of the Anthropocene, which is the era where humans have become the most impactful species on Earth. And recognizing that our actions have this level of impact is the first step to addressing the causes of climate change. We also investigated the five archetypical pathways, each of which provided some method for improving technology at the institutional level, with a focus on sustainability. Nearing the end of our mind map journey, we're left with a topic that entices a call to action. Can technological failure be avoided? And if so, how can we steer it towards success? We looked at some rules of technological fixes, but focused heavily on responsible research and innovation. RRI occurs when actors become responsive to societal demands and tackle potential problems before they become problems, ultimately steering the development of a technology, and by doing so, also avoiding failure. 
And so it looks like we've come full circle, only now I think it's safe to say that we all have a much deeper understanding of technological failure. Thanks for watching.